Okay, so welcome to my last lecture. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for being here. So at the beginning of this lecture, I want to talk about something very important, which is on the one hand a triumph and on the one other hand a tragedy. And the triumph is that the result that I want to talk about, well, it was called, and I think rightly so, the most profound discovery in science. And the tragedy is that, uh, unfortunately, many physicists, I would say the majority of working physicists today, do not fully appreciate this result and its meaning and its full impact. Um, so the result that was called the most profound discovery in science is that nature is non-local. It's that quantum mechanics reveals and experiment confirms a fundamental non-locality in nature. This means that indeed what happens over here can be influenced in more or less yeah, instantaneously as we think by something that happens arbitrarily far away. And um, I think uh, many of you are familiar with the result that I'm talking about, which is Bell's theorem and the violation of the Bell inequalities. At least made some people mentioned it in the discussion. But as I said, this is a result that is very rarely fully appreciated. And so I think it's important to, to discuss it. And if you're very familiar with it, then we can go a bit faster. But it's good to discuss it in detail. So as you may know, the relevant setup um, which is also more or less what is used in experiment today, is the so-called EPRB experiment, where you consider a pair of entangled particles in the spin singlet state, and these particles come out of a source, and they move in opposite direction towards the stern gerlach magnet, where you perform a spin measurement. And here you can uh, basically choose freely or randomly the angle at which the Stern-Gerlach magnet is oriented, so the direction in which you want to measure the spin. And the spin singlet state is such that um, in uh, every direction, a spin measurement on one particle would give with probability one half spin up and with probability one half spin down. But if you measure both particles in the same direction, you will always measure opposite spin. Right? So for values in between, this is important. The spin statistics are correlated. This is, of course, what Bell's theorem uses. But the first observation are these perfect anti-coincidences predicted by quantum mechanics. So it seems that the result of a spin measurement on any one particle is random with probability one half spin up and with probability one half spin down. But whenever you measure uh, the spin of both particles in the same direction, you will find that they have opposite spin. One particle has spin up, the other particle has spin down. And this gives rise to a dilemma, which was first formulated by EPR, uh, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, maybe not as clearly as it could have been, but the dilemma is the following. So suppose that we measure on the first particle, we perform a spin measurement on the first particle in some direction, and we measure spin up in some direction A, then we know immediately that the same measurement on the other particle, no matter how far away that measurement happens, will give us the result spin down. And now this leaves us with only two possibilities, only two logical possibilities. Either this fact obtained before, so actually the spin of the second particle was predetermined before, independent of the measurement on the first particle, right? But if this is so, then the quantum mechanical description is incomplete, because according to the standard quantum mechanical description, this outcome is random. Quantum mechanics does not allow, or, or at least not contain, predetermined spin values. The second possibility is that, in fact, the measurement on the first particle has made it such that the same measurement on the second particle will uh, give the result spin down. But this means that we have non-locality. This means that the measurement on the first particle 
actually influence the state of the second particle, such as to determine or at least influence the measurement uh, of its spin of the second particle. So we have this dilemma. Either the A spin of particle two was determined before, independent of the measurement on particle one, then quantum mechanics is incomplete. Or the measurement on particle one has determined the spin of particle two. Then we have an instance of non-locality because these measurements happen to arbitrary accuracy uh, simultaneously at the same time at basically arbitrary large distances. And you should think this through and in particular ask yourself, is there any other way? Could there be any other logical options? And I think this is not. This is the EPR dilemma. Either the spin was predetermined, so the quantum mechanical description is incomplete, or actually the measurement on the first spin has an influence on the measurement on the second spin, and we have non-locality. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. So, yeah. We will st stress this more uh, as we go on, but yes, in relativistic language, these two events are space like separated. So, no signal that goes at most with the speed of light could reach from one side of the experiment to the other side of the experiment. So, this is what we mean by yeah, space like separation. No, this is not the same. This is not the same sort of non-locality because these conservation laws they held before. It was predetermined, so to speak. So we will show out. We will show that. We will see that. I think when we discuss. No, it's not. Okay, we'll, we will see how the argument goes, and then you can comment when, when we make this argument. So now here comes Bell's theorem, which simply put rules out the second, rules out the first option. So of course quantum mechanics is still incomplete in the sense that we discussed yesterday, in the sense that you have a measurement problem, right? Um, but you cannot add additional variables to the quantum mechanical descriptions that would predetermine the outcome of such spin measurements. So the statistical predictions of quantum mechanics cannot be reproduced by assuming locally predetermined spin values, also often called hidden variables. And uh, this is a very nice uh, simple result, an astonishingly simple result that we can easily uh, prove. <coughs> Namely, Let's assume that, so we consider the spin measurements in three different directions, in three different angles, and we assume that they are predetermined. What it means is that we assume there exist random variables corresponding to the outcomes of the spin measurement. So x1, a, this is the angle, this is called arbitrary angles x to b with values in values in plus minus one. Okay, for three different, these are the predetermined outcomes of the spin measurement and such that they fulfill the perfect anti-coincidences. So we look at them in three different directions. They have to satisfy these perfect anti-coincidences. So yeah, let me write it here, minus x to c. And then we look at the probabilities of these anti-coincidences. So what is the probability that 
the spin of particle one in direction one is opposite to the spin of particle two in direction in direction B, let's say, plus the probability that the spin of particle one in direction B is opposite to the spin of particle two in direction C, let's say, plus the remaining possibility C equals, we just sum up this probability is assuming that these predetermined value, these predetermined uh, spin variables exist. But this according to these properties, these perfect anti-correlations is the same as So the value of the spin value of particle two in the direction B is opposite to the spin value of one in the direction B. So I can here everywhere change um, the in upper index two by the upper index one while also changing plus to minus. But these var variables can only take one of two values, plus one or minus one, corresponding to spin up or to spin down. Okay, so this is actually the sure event. Okay, one of these possibilities, so I should make one intermediate step. This is of course larger or equal than E or This is just standard probability theory. But this is just a sure event. So you have two different values, plus one and minus one, that you can distribute on this uh, three variables, and two of them have to be equal. So this equals one. This is the sure event. And this is a version, a very simple version of the Bell inequality. And it's remarkable, I think, how easy it is to derive just by standard probability theory, assuming the existence of these random variables. And these random variables, there's also a locality assumption here that um, they do not depend on the orientation of the other stern gerlach magnet. So the outcome here of uh, the first the spin measurement on the first particle just depends on the local parameter setting and not on the distance parameter setting. And this is just what we have seen here, a derivation of the Bell inequality. And now you can compare it for once with the prediction of quantum mechanics for the spin singlet state. You choose, for instance, for A, uh, an angle of zero degrees, for B, an angle of 120 degrees, for C, an angle of 240 degrees, and quantum mechanics predicts for this probability here a value of three quarters, which is clearly smaller than one. So this means that no local model can explain the correlations predicted by quantum mechanics. But quantum mechanics could be wrong, of course. So we have to do the experiment and check. And so we do the experiment, this EPR experiment, and we do check the Bell inequality, and we now have very recently a so-called loophole-free inequality, which is actually such that the measurements were taken at so large um, distances and with a high enough accuracy so that one can exclude uh, any communication uh, which goes at most with speed of light. And these experiments confirm the violation of the Bell inequality. And since they confirm the violation of the Bell inequality, or in fact a slightly more general inequality that we can discuss later, which is called the CHSH inequality, that means that no local model can account for these correlations observed in experiment. And this is why we say that nature is non-local. There is one caveat here that this is why I talked about the CHSH inequality. 
this Bell inequality assumes these perfect spin anti-correlations. Okay, but they are of course predicted by quantum mechanics for the spin singlet state, but again, quantum mechanics could be wrong. So maybe, and of course in experiment, you cannot observe these anti-correlations 100% of the time. You observe them, I don't know, 90 or 94% of the time, depending on the experiment. So you want an argument that does not assume these perfect anti-correlations. And this is what we will do, uh, will do soon, if you want. So and with this argument that does not assume this perfect anti-correlation, it really means that no local theory whatsoever can explain the statistical correlations predicted by quantum mechanics and observed in experiment. And hence we say that nature is indeed non-local. In nature we do observe this non-local correlations that cannot be explained by any local model. And here is the, there are many misunderstandings of this argument, some just innocently and some willful, but one most common argument is to miss this EPR part. So Bell's first paper on this, where he presented the first version of the Bell inequality, was called on the Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen paradox. So this is an argument that starts from this EPR dilemma, that starts from this EPR argument. Right? Because the EPR argument is either we have to assume that the spin values are predetermined, okay, or else we have non-locality. That means to save locality, okay, to not conclude that the measurement over here actually has an influence on what happens at the measurement over there, we have to assume that the spin outcomes, that these outcomes of the measurement are actually predetermined. But exactly this is what Bell's theorem then shows to be impossible. So what many people take away, they understand Bell's theorem as a no hidden variables theorem. Bell's theorem tells us that we cannot introduce local hidden variables, uh, local hidden variables that explain the correlations predicted by quantum mechanics and observed in experiment. And this is correct, Bell's inequality the violation of Bell's inequality actually shows that. Bell's theorem actually shows that. But it all starts from the EPR dilemma, right? If we rule out these hidden variables, that the spin outcomes are predetermined, this actually leaves us only with the second option, only with the second possibility, which is non-locality, right? So if you understand Bell's theorem just as no, no hidden variables theorem, you're missing the punchline, you're missing the point of the whole exercise. The point of the whole exercise is to rule out here the first option, leaving us only with the second option, with non-locality. And here's John Bell from his famous article called Bertelmann Socks and the Nature of Reality. And he expresses a bit his frustration with this misunderstanding, which obviously happened already at his time. So he says, it is important to note that to the limited degree that determinism plays a role in the EPR argument, determinism means the existence of these hidden variables that predetermine the outcome of the spin measurement. So to the limited degree that determinism plays a role in the EPR argument, it is not assumed but inferred. What is held sacred is the principle of local causality no action at a distance. So the principle that if we do the measurement here on particle one, and then we know, okay, the outcome of the measurement on particle two, locality means that this outcome must have been predetermined because my measurement here, assuming locality, cannot have any influence on the measurement there. It is remarkably difficult to get this point across that determinism is not a presupposition of the analysis. There's a widespread and erroneous conviction that for Einstein, determinism was always the sacred principle. The quotability of his famous, God does not play dice, has not helped in this respect. So determinism, or in other words, the existence of hidden variables, this is not where the argument starts. The argument starts from the assumption of locality, right? From locality, you infer the existence of these hidden variables. 
these hidden variables are ruled out by the violation of the Bell inequality, leaving you only with one option, namely non-locality. So indeed, the outcome of the measurement over there was not predetermined before the, we made the measurement over here. So the measurement over here of particle A actually has an influence of what happens over there at the measurement of particle B, although these two measurement events are space-like separated. And this is what has been called the most profound discovery in science. So nature is indeed non-local. And as I said, there is one shortcoming of this argument, namely it assumes the perfect anti-correlations. So then you can make a somewhat more general argument that does not presuppose these perfect anti-correlations. And the somehow more general argument is also, um, is also a bit more precise about terminology, what we actually mean by non-local. If you're worried about that. So this is supposed to be a space-time diagram. Here in this region of space-time, we have the measurement event A. Capital A is the outcome of the first spin measurement. Capital B is the outcome of the second me spin measurement. And small a and b are the parameter choices that are supposed to be chosen freely or randomly and determine the direction in which we actually want to move the spin. And these two events are space-like separated, meaning that no signal going at most with the speed of light can communicate between them. And here, what we observed in the experiment are correlations between these outcomes. Statistical correlations, so which are most drastic if we measure the spin in the same direction, we have this perfect anti-correlations, but we still have statistical correlations uh, even in, uh, if we measure in different directions. And statistical correlations just means that. So the probability of spin up and spin down, let's say, uh, for particle one and two, is not the same as the product of the individual probabilities. However, correlations, of course, do not imply causation. For instance, the, the weather in Bangalore and the weather, weather in Mumbai are probably heavily correlated if you do a statistic over the years. But it doesn't mean, of course, that the weather in Mumbai actually causally influences or determines the uh, weather in Bangalore. You just have to control for other variables. So you control, for instance, for the time of year, and you control for the geometrical region. You hold that fix, and you control maybe for the temperature of the Pacific Ocean or for the winds coming from the ocean and so on and so forth. So you hold fix all parameters that might locally explain the weather in Bangalore and the weather in Mumbai, right? And those parameters here, they are designated by this variable lambda. So you hold fixed in the past of these events all relevant data, all relevant events and physical quantities and common causes, so to speak, that could explain this correlation. And this correlation then is locally explicable according to Bell if the probabilities become independent once you condition on all the relevant common causes lambda. And of course, then, if you integrate over, this, integrate out this additional factor lambda with the respective probability distribution, you have to get back the original probabilities. Okay? This is like when, I don't know, let's say, uh, I get sick this evening, and Andre gets sick this evening, and we are in our rooms, okay? This doesn't mean that my being sick has someone causally determined, determined his being sick, but we should look for common causes in the past, okay? We could, should look, for instance, at what we ate for lunch today or what we ate for dinner today. So it's nothing against the food here, which is pretty good. <laughs> but it's just a hypothetical example. So if I condition on that, okay? So if you hold that fixed, would be in the, as encoded in this parameter lambda, this should explain the correlation. So if we condition the probabilities 
on what we had for dinner, let's say, then um, the probability should become independent, showing that there is actually no causal influence from my well-being to his well-being. And in the physical theory, of course, the physical theory has to tell us what the relevant data could be, what the relevant physical variables or quantities lambda could be that we have at our disposal to explain these correlations. And why do we call this locally explicable? So it's just if you write down from the conditional probabilities, here this joint probabilities, you can just split it like this, okay? But if lambda specifies the complete relevant state of the system in the past, okay, then the specification of the outcome B, assuming locality, shouldn't have any uh, influence on the outcome A. And similarly, the parameter setting B here, which happens here in the space-like separated region, shouldn't have any influence on the outcome A. And similarly, the parameter choice A shouldn't have any influence on the outcome B. And if you want, there's also this terminology. Um, so loc this locality assumption is a conjunction of two assumptions, parameter independence and outcome independence, just in case you heard this terminology. So outcome independence means assuming locality and holding fixed all possible common causes in the past. The outcome B cannot have any influence, cannot give you any additional information on the outcome A. Yes, this is exactly what our theory has to tell us. So if we analyze a physical theory, then the physical theory should tell us what could be the relevant physical variables, the relevant physical quantities here in the past that could explain our relations. It could be position of particles, it could be wave function, it could be co configurations of fields, it could be other types of physical events. Whatever the theory tells us could be relevant for explaining On the, what do you mean on the states? Uh, on the, so it should not depend on these parameter choices, A and B, because they tip in the f uh, future, but they can depend on the state of the particles in the past when they leave the source, for instance. So the source for the particles come out would be here, and then one particle propagates here and one particle propagates there. So this lambda could, of course, include the state of the EPR pair prepared in the past, but it could also include the state of the source from which the particles came and the ready state of the measurement apparatus and so on and so forth. So the first step is actually to apply this definition to standard quantum mechanics and ask us what resources does standard quantum mechanics offer us to explain these correlations. And all, every, all that you have in standard quantum mechanics is the wave function, so this uh, singlet state wave function of the system and possibly, at least in the old Copenhagen picture, so-called classical variables that describe your laboratory and the measurement apparatus and the source. So according to the old orthodox quantum mechanics, these are supposed to be described by uh, classical variables. So what standard quantum mechanics would offer us as relevant common causes would be this, the wave function and some classical variables, but this is not enough to provide a local explanation. So this is here a big mistake. This should be not equal. This is not equal here. So this lambda here given by quantum mechanics is not enough to give us a local explanation of the EPR correlations. You can hold here fixed the wave function and all these variables that you want. This does not make your probability split. So it does not give a local explanation in the sense of Bell. So this is one thing that is always very frustrating, that there's this huge debate for years whether standard quantum mechanics is non-local or not. And if, at least if you stick to non-locality in the sense of Bell, 
So call it Belmont locality if you want. This is just a matter of checking a definition. Okay, you don't even need the Bell theorem or the Bell inequality or the CHSH inequality for that. You just need to check the definition. Standard quantum mechanics predicts statistical correlations between space-like separated events. It doesn't give us the resources to give a local explanation of these correlations. So, in the sense of Bell, by definition, the theory is non-local. And now the only question that arises is, can you add additional so-called hidden variables to quantum mechanics to make, to give a local explanation, to make this theory local? And this is exactly what the Bell theorem rules out. So where are the, there are some slides missing, are ah, here. order, so you derive the CHSH inequality, which is a generalization of the Bell inequality, and it depends only on two assumptions. One is this locality assumptions, so assuming that you specify everything that would be relevant in the past, this probability split, and there's one and only one additional assumption, which is the no conspiracy assumption, namely the probability distribution of these parameters, lambda, in particular of the so-called hidden variables, is independent of the parameter choices A and B. And why would we call this no conspiracy? So there are basically just two possibilities how this could be violated. Either there is some retrocausal influence from these parameters A and B to the past state of the system, which is actually a possibility that some people take seriously, but this is in this sense ruled out here by assumption, or we have some sort of super determinism, which is that whatever there is in the world that determines here the relevant influences on the system also determines the parameter choices that are going to be made by the experimentalists. But this, many people argued, would be even more mind-boggling than non-locality. It would mean that in fact, it would put into question the whole scientific method because we couldn't really choose what kind of questions we asked to nature and experiment because whatever determines the state of a system that we measure also determines what we measure and how we measure it in such a way as to trick us into believing that there are non-local co correlations, which in fact there aren't. So this is one logical possibility, but this would be clearly conspiratorial, such an explanation. So this is ruled out. And from this two assumptions, if we have time, we can, we can derive it. Should we derive the CHSH inequality, or do you know it? Sorry? Yes, I will try. Okay, so let's then not derive it. So just take this inequality for granted, which is also easy to derive a bit. Uh, uh, it's a few more lines than this, but also fairly easy. So from these two assumptions, we can derive this inequality, which is called the CHSH inequality. This is now about the expectation value for uh, four different parameter choices, and it is this inequality that is usually tested in experiment. And from quantum mechanics, you have a maximal violation of this inequality, which is two square root of two, which is obviously larger than two. And in fact, in experiment, you confirm this violation of this CHSH inequality, um, of course, very, in fact, very uh, clearly. So within the margin of error, ruling out any local explanation of these non-local correlations. And again, this is why we say that nature is indeed non-local with this few caveats that we mentioned, like the non-conspiracy assumption, right? The only possibility that remains is indeed non-locality. So there are correlations in nature between space-like separated events that are observed in experiments and predicted by quantum mechanics that cannot be explained by any local 
non-conspiratorial theory. So this is, again, I'm repeating myself, but just because it's so important why we say that nature is not local. Yes? Can you speak up, please? By non-conspiratorial, this is just assumption here. It means that the models that we test basically and that we rule out with the CHSH inequality, they must be such that whatever relevant variables or parameters there could be in the past, the statistical distribution should be independent of these parameter choices A and B. Okay, and these parameter choices, so in practice, they are not really freely chosen by the experimentalists but they are chosen by a random number generator, for instance, an experiment, but they are chosen so uh, quickly and so uh, close to the actual measurement that there cannot be any uh, light-like signaling uh, between the event of this choice and the measurement here, or vice versa. And the idea is that if the explanation would be that no matter how we set up the choice of these parameters, if we uh, if we turn the uh, Stern-Gerlach magnet to zero degrees or to 45 degrees. So no matter if we couple it to a random number generator or if we make a free choice of ex ex experimentalist or if we couple it to the uh, values of the Dow Jones at the New York Stock Exchange, you know? This is all predetermined by the same variables that predetermine the state of the system here. Then we would say that such an explanation is conspiratorial. It's just sort of super deterministic. And this is excluded by alternative. Yeah, that's a that's a good that's a good question. So it I, I think causation is a difficult term. It's also philosophically a difficult term. So actually not even in the among philosophers, there is a consensus on what we actually mean by causation. So I would prefer to, I would prefer to leave this, to leave this open. So every correct theory of nature has to have some form of non-locality, and then you can discuss if you have a milder form of non-locality or if you have a stronger form of non-locality. So. Um, for instance, in Bohmian mechanics, you have this explicitly non-local law of motion for the particles. So actually, the um, parameter choice here determines right what the wave function is doing, and then the particle positions here have an instantaneous influence on the motion of the particles there, just via the law of motion. In a GRW theory, the non-locality shows a bit differently. You have here, again, this parameter choices depend, uh, determine the, how the wave function splits. And then the measurement event here triggers a collapse of the measured wave function over there. This is also an instant of non-locality. But here the outcomes are inherently random, whereas in Bohmian mechanics they are, in principle, uh, determined. Some people say that because the outcomes are still inherently random, that this is a milder form of non-locality. Others disagree, so we will have to discuss this. Yeah. No, it's not. It's it's not a problem. It's a challenge. So I think non-locality is not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. The non-locality is not a it's not a problem. It's not any kind of inconsistency. It's just, I think, a fact of nature and a feature of every correct quantum theory. But there is a challenge how to make it compatible, as you said, with relativity. So there is no straightforward contradiction between non-locality and relativity, but there is a certain tension between non-locality and relativity. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, this is one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes and no. So this is actually what I wanted to talk about here. Uh, no signaling, basically. This is the first thing that one could be afraid of, that you could use quantum non-locality for faster than light signaling. And this is not possible. There are various theorems that says that it's not possible. But there is still then a challenge how to account in special relativity for these non-local correlations. And um, the reason is precisely that there's no absolute simultaneity. Okay, so you could have a picture where, where uh, let's say, this measure happens slightly before that measurement, okay, and then you have an influence from, from here to there, let's say, if you want to make this non-locality explicit. But in special relativity, there's no absolute time ordering between space-like separated events. So there are some frames of reference in which this measurement happens before that measurement. There are other frames of reference in which this measurement happens first, and this measurement happens later. And so there doesn't seem to be any Lorentz invariant way in which really you could make a theory that tells you which measurement influences the other measurement. So this is a, a challenge how to Yes. Not 100% efficient, but yeah, efficient, efficient enough. Yes, they close the detector and the locality. No, I, I don't know this work or this argument, but I would be very skeptical because this argument is very general. It doesn't make any assumption about what this lambda are. No, no, not necessarily. It's just not necessarily, no. So in fact, what, it doesn't matter for the argument what sort of objects you use to represent these events or what sort of physical variables they are. So in fact, this cannot make any difference. What some people tried is to, for instance, which is, I guess, a logical possibility is to modify classical probability theory. So to work on different probability spaces that are not standard probability spaces. And then this proof obviously does not, does not necessarily go through. So it might be, I'm, I don't know this work, but it might be something something along that lines. Okay. But I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know this particular. Sorry? Mm -hmm. There's no assumption of realism. This is the point, this is what most people get, get wrong. Also, of course, because of EPR, because they had this language in there. But there is no additional assumption of realism in here, whatever you mean by that. What some people mean by realism is this assumption of these additional hidden variables, which are then ruled out. But again, this is the misunderstanding that they forget the first part. You need to, these hidden variables, to try to save, non to try to save locality in the first place. just talks about, so this theorem just talks about the probabilities of measurement outcomes. I mean, this is something that you will often read or you will often hear that there are some assumptions of realism or whatever, but it's not clear what, it's generally not, usually not clear what it means and there's just no assumption like that in there. So the assumptions here are the two that I wrote. So again, some people say that by writing down this lambda, you assume some sort of realism about whatever. But this is not true. This lambda, again, is just 
whatever the theory gives you as resources. Try to explain these correlations. And if the theory gives you nothing to explain these correlations, because it's like if you want anti-realist about everything, then you are stuck with this non-local one of these misunderstandings that I talked about. There's no reality or realism assumption in addition to those two assumptions. Yes? There's no reality assumption. I don't know what it means. Sorry? There's no reality assumption. I don't know. I don't know what you mean by that. Why? What? what? Lambda is whatever the theory postulates there could be that explains the correlation. Lambda could include variables describing the source if the theory tells, that, tells you that these variables would be relevant to, to describe the measurement outcomes. But there's no, what additional assumption is there? I mean, if you want to be anti-realist with respect to the source where the particles came out and be anti-realist about that, whatever this means. But there's no additional, th those, are the only two, those are the only two assumptions and there's nothing very philosophically deep about that. This is relatively straightforward. So, yes? This would be the most obvious choice and the most obvious attempt, yeah. So in the most e simplest case, lambda would be a hidden variable for the spin outcome. And those are ruled out, they cannot exist. It could be the theory, the theorem allows, allows that. If the theory wants to introduce some auxiliary fields are separate from the particles, then yeah, the theory could, could do that and then you would include this in your lambda, but it doesn't help anyway. So the theorem is just more, more general than that. Yes? Not in uh, detail, I don't know this in detail, but as I said, so there are people who instead of accepting non-locality, they are going to desperate measures which are give up logic or give up classical probability theory. So yeah, those are in principle things that you could do to avoid the validity of the theorem. The question is then how useful are are these approaches? This is, I mean, you have to, you have to judge, you have to judge that. Yes, sorry, yes. It is context, contextual, why? I'm not sure if this I'm not sure if this notion is helpful here. So this notion of contextuality usually comes from the Kaufman Specker theorem, which is also a not also, which is a so-called no hidden variables theorem. 
and the assumption there is contextuality. And if you want to introduce so-called hidden variables that violate this theorem, those are contextual hidden variables. But again, I'm, I, mean, I don't think this is pertinent to this analysis, so maybe you can explain it to me afterwards, but I don't see how this is pertinent to this analysis. So this is here, the assumption here is locality, which is much more interesting than non-contextuality as an assumption. So one question that arises now is, could we use quantum nano locality for faster than light signaling? And if we could, why would it be so bad? And um, so there, there's an easy answer, which is not quite accurate, is that uh, special, the theory of special relativity tells us that nothing can go faster than light. So there cannot be, for that reason, any faster than light signaling. And this is... Uh, yeah, this is, in, this is to some degree correct, but the theory really implies the relativistic kinematics that no massive object can accelerate to, accelerate to uh, speeds faster than the speeds of light. So in theory, this leaves, possible, uh, this leaves open the possibilities of stuff or entities that already move with velocities faster than the speed of light. So they're usually called tachyons. So this is, of course, highly speculative, but yeah, it is a bit too simple to say that uh, non that signaling, fast and light signaling is ruled out just because nothing can go uh, faster than light. But there's another thing that people would, uh, that people usually worry about, and let me tell you just one, uh, one story maybe to illustrate this. So Let's suppose that we are in a game show and which here's the contestant in the finale. He has to choose one of two gates, either gate A or gate B. And uh, behind one of these gates, there's a prize and between other, the, the other uh, is, well, is wrong. There's no prize there. I don't know if you have such a game show on Indian television. There used to be such a game show on German television. Yes, there was with three gates actually. So let's suppose he picks gate A and he opens this gate and this is wrong. So the price is not behind gate A, the price is behind gate B, so he lost. However, he now made a, uh, an arrangement with his accomplice and they are trying to use quantum non-locality for, non for fast and light signaling to cheat. So what he does is to send an, let's assume that it's instantaneous, an instantaneous signal to his accomplice, which is in a space rocket. And his accomplice moves in the space rocket at very high speeds, so close to the speed of light. But as we said, there's no absolute simultaneity in a special relativistic setting. So what he could do then, this accomplice in the space rocket, is he could send in his frame of reference an instantaneous signal so to speak, if that is possible at all. But in his frame of reference, since he moves according to, uh, he moves very close to the speed of light in this rocket, an instantaneous signal would actually reach this guy here in his past. So what he could do is after he opened the wrong gate A, he could signal to his friend here in the spaceship and tell him the correct gate is B, then the friend in the spaceship could send another rocket, which uh, so could send another message, which reaches this guy here in the past, telling him that the correct gate is B, and then this guy, when he is in the game show, opens gate B instead of gate A. And the problem of the story is, of course, not just that it is uh, cheating, but that it is logically inconsistent, right? This would be a causal paradox, so to speak. It is not possible that he first opens he first opens gate A, then you do this scheme of non-local signaling, he gets a message in the past, and the message tells him actually to open gate B, and then he opens gate B, right? Because, and then when he opens gate B, he actually never signals to this other guy, and so on and so forth. So this would be a causal paradox. So this is one of the things that people are worried about 
And let's assume, right. 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 The argument, sorry. You just they give the argument why they can't do it. Of course, they can't do it for the reason that you already mentioned. This is perfectly correct, but we have to make sure or understand why this is not possible. So here is a worry that how you might think that it could be possible, which it actually isn't. So let's suppose that they uh, agree on the following communication protocol. So they both prepare many entangled particles in the spin singlet state. So the magnet of V, V, let's say, is the guy in the rocket ship, is always oriented in the Z direction. So in the default position, the Stengerlach magnet of A, let's say this is the, the guy in the game show, is oriented in the X direction. And in this position, of course, A and B will measure spin up and spin down with probability one half. But now suppose that these guys are actually Bohmians, so they believe in Bohmian mechanics. So they believe that the outcome of the spin measurement is actually determined, and you could know, in principle, the outcome, or no, you could, yeah, suppose, absurdly, which you can, that you could know the exact Bohmian position of the particles, and you would know then if his uh, measurement would reveal spin up or spin down. Then he could make the following decision. He sent a signal, he turns his stern gerlach magnet into the Z direction, if and only if he knows that he will measure spin up, okay? And that will increase the probability that B measures spin down from one half to three quarter, okay? And then by making a series of measurements, B could determine that R actually flipped his magnet and send it a signal. And of course, if you think about this signaling or non-signaling just as zero or one, you could encode any message you want in, this, in, in just uh, bits of zero or one, and in principle, send any message you want. Okay, so this might be the concern that you have. But of course, this is impossible because we proved today that R cannot know the exact position of the Bohmian particles if you believe that they exist. In fact, he cannot, not that only that he cannot know the exact positions, he cannot have more knowledge of the position than given by, um, by the psi square distribution. This is what we call the theorem of absolute uncertainty. Okay, so he cannot know, use any knowledge of the, uh, of the initial state of the system to predict the outcome of his spin measurement better than via the usual quantum probabilities. And of course, the usual quantum probabilities they have this feature, okay? Since he doesn't know and cannot control this, um, the outcome of his spin experiment, no matter uh, what he chooses as a parameter A, okay, if you sum up your all probabilities, either he gets spin up or he gets spin down. Um, if you sum this up, then you will see that the probability uh, for any outcome B is independent of the out of the measure of the parameter choice A. So exactly, in fact, what you said. Because he cannot know the outcome of his spin measurement, it is completely random. So according to collapse models in a GRW theory, it, it would even be intrinsically random. So he couldn't even hypothetically, there's nothing that he could know to predict the outcomes of his spin experiment. But this is the reason um, that, well, the outcome of a spin measurement is random, so you cannot do anything else than just average over these outcomes, but averaging over these outcomes cancels out any form of non-local correlation. So here the statistics of B do no longer depend on uh, the parameter choice A if you average over all possible outcomes A. And this is des therefore sometimes called the no signaling condition. And the no signaling condition, well, is a theorem in quantum mechanics, and it's also a theorem in Bohmian mechanics, and then if you assume, so in quantum equilibrium, and this is the reason why you cannot exploit quantum monocality to send uh, non-local 
to send faster than light signals. And in fact, just a, a side remark, um, a slightly more, a slightly stronger condition than no signaling is what is sometimes called local commutativity. So the operators or as or the positive operator value measured, the POVM that we discussed um, this morning associated with the measurements, if these measurements happen in space-like separated regions of space, they must commute, okay? And this is easy to see in principle morally why they must commute if the operators associated to two measurements do not commute, then the statistics depend on the order on the sequence in which you perform the experiments, okay? If two the associated operators do not commute, then it matters if you make first the measurement A and then the measurement B, or first the measurement B and then the measurement A. But if you now think in a special relativistic setting, there is no absolute time ordering, so no objective matter of fact as to which measurement happens first if this measurement happen in space-like separated region of space. And therefore, and this is, uh, therefore, you usually demand or assume that this operator or problems associated to measurements in space-like separated events commute. And then it's a relatively straightforward computation to see that from this assumption, the no signaling condition follows. And um, so in the case of the EPRB experiment, it's trivial that the operators commute because they are just here, this is the operator here associated to, to the first measurement. And this is the operator here associated to the second measurement. You have here just a tensor product. And they, they trivially commute with few operators. And this is also an, another source of uh, confusion, unfortunately of terminology, because if you do quantum field theory, in particular so algebraic quantum field theory, um, this is often called, this commutativity is often called locality condition or locality assumption. And these theories are co commonly called local field theories, okay? And so you could think that they cannot be, by construction, they cannot be non-local in the sense we just discussed, but this is just an unfortunate terminology. So if you do in field theory, when they talk about local field theory or locality assumption, that they always mean this local commutativity. Okay, but this doesn't exclude non-local correlations in the sense of in the sense of Bell. So yeah, this is let's say the first worry that we left aside that quantum non-locality could lead to non-local, to faster than light signaling. This is not the case. So the worst, our worst fear of incompatibility between non-locality and relativity may already be out of the way. But there are additional challenges um, that I would roughly separate into the problem of interaction, the problem of synchronization, and the problem of probabilities. So the problem of interaction, strictly speaking, to be honest, has probably nothing to do with, uh, with quantum non-locality, but I want to make this point nonetheless that, in fact, we do not know how to make consistent relativistic interactions. In every theory that we have so far, we have a problem with self-interaction and so-called UV divergencies. This is just the lowest order uh, self-energy diagram in QED, which leads to UV divergencies, but you already have this problem in classical electrodynamics. When you have point particles in the electromagnetic field, the electromagnetic field is infinite at the position of the point particle, so that the theory is not well defined. And in fact, it's uh, the same, or at least a very similar problem that we also have in quantum field. And most physicists are very pragmatic about that, and maybe they have a point there. After all, if you renormalize the field theory, uh, then they work extremely well experimentally. 
but I personally am very unsatisfied with this situation. And I like to show you two quotes of people <laughs> who are also unsatisfied with this situation. One is Richard Feynman, who said, I don't think we have a completely satisfactory relativistic quantum mechanical model, even one that doesn't agree with nature, but at least agrees with the logic that the sum of probability of all alternatives has to be 100%. Therefore, I think that the renormalization theory is simply a way to sweep the difficulties of the divergencies of electrodynamics under the rug. I am, of course, not sure of that. And the greatest thing is that this is quote is actually from his Nobel speech. So he got, just got awarded the Nobel Prize for his contributions to quantum electrodynamics. And he goes on stage in front of the academy and says that, well, to be honest, I do not believe that we have a satisfying uh, theory of quantum electrodynamics. And here's uh, Dirac, who in fact was the one who first came up with the renormalization scheme. Uh, when he treated his, uh, the classical electron, basically he invented this procedure of mass renormalization. And also, he says, most physicists are very satisfied with the situation. They say quantum electrodynamics is a good theory, and we do not have to worry about it anymore. I must say that I'm very dissatisfied with the situation, because the so-called good theory does involve neglecting infinities, which appear in its equations, neglecting them in an arbitrary way. This is just not sensible mathematics. Sensible mathematics involves neglecting a quantity when it turns out to be small, not neglecting it just because it is infinitely great and you do not want it. Okay, so when I talk to particle physicists and I tell them there's a problem with field theory and with field divergence, you usually get in a huge fight because, of course, there's some story that you can tell renormalization theory is not, maybe not arbitrary in the sense that Dirac uh, says here, and there is of course a story that you know that the theory is supposed to break down at certain scales and you do a cutoff and so on and so forth. But I still just wanted to use this opportunity to give you just uh, food for thought that maybe there is something fundamentally problematic about that. There's another problem which I call the problem of synchronization, and this has to do with this fact that we already observed. Uh, yes. Yes, there's in addition the infrared divergence, yes. Sorry? Yes, I think it's a problem, but I don't know, people tell me that they know in, princi know in principle how to deal with the infrared divergence, but I'm not sure if this is, I'm not sure if this is true. But in some sense, so the UV divergence I understand better because this is actually this, this is more or less the same divergence as you have classically for the self-interaction problem. But I couldn't give you a competent comment on what the current state is of getting rid of the V divergence and infrared divergence. But I feel like, I, I think the feeling in the quantum field theory community is that, yes, we know that our current best theories are not UV complete, that you need, in any case, a UV cutoff but that the IR divergence is something that you can, in principle, get rid of. I think this is the general feeling. So what I call this uh, problem of synchronization is that which I tried to measure before. So here we have the situation. This is a bit of another diagram, but assuming locality, it would mean, of course, that if you specify everything that is relevant in this region, what happens over here in this light cone basically should have no additional influence on this outcome here. But this is violated in, uh, for entangled system for quantum correlations. However, if you are in special relativistic space time, there is no absolute time ordering between space like separated events. So there are some Lorentz frames, some frames of reference in which the measurement B happens before the measurement. There are other frames of reference in which the measurement A happens before the measurement A. And if you take Lorentz invariance seriously, then special relativity tells us that these two descriptions, these two frames are completely equivalent. 
physically, that none of them should be physically uh, preferred. So it's difficult if you do a model how to explain these correlations, right? How to say that one measurement influences the other or the other way around. There doesn't seem to be a Lorentz invariant way to make this precise. So if you assume, in other words, or to put it the other way around, so as, let's assume that let's assume that here you have a theory that gives you that predicts the outcome B. If you describe it in this frame of reference, okay, in which the measurement A and the parameter choice small a are in the future, then this outcome B cannot depend on this. Sorry, cannot depend on this parameter choice A and this outcome A because in this frame this hasn't happened yet the future, so to speak. If you make the prediction in the other frame, then you it would seem that uh, this measurement here, whatever determines this me measurement here, must be independent of what happens over there, because in this frame, this happens in the future, right? So it cannot have any influence on what happens over here. But this both cannot be true at the same time. Because if that is true at the same time, if you have a theory that predicts the outcome A, or at least the statistics for the outcome A, independence of, independent of this parameter choice and outcome B, and the theory, the same theory that predicts the outcome B independent of the outcome and parameter choice A, then this would reduce to a local model. And it's precisely these local models that are ruled out by the violation of the CHSH inequality respectively the experiments that predict this violation. Uh, yes, I will, there's a question. Just quickly. So it, uh, well, it, de it depends on how long, so you, it suffices for, Yes, in the simplest case, there are both inertial frames. So you would just have inertial Lorentz frames in the simplest case. Of course, if you consider, if you think about a generally covariant theory where you can take any, any space like hypersurface, this makes the problem only worse. But here in this picture, there are just inertial Lorentz frames. So re let me repeat this argument. This argument so was put most precisely in, in this form by by Nicolas Gisin in a small paper. So let's assume we have a Lorentz covariant, Lorentz invariant theory that explains these non-local correlations. Okay, at least let's say in a deterministic way. So we first consider the predictions of the theory in this frame, in one inertial Lorentz frame, in which the measurement B happens before the measurement A. In this frame, the theory should predict the outcome B in a way independent of capital A and small a because in this, this frame, these events lie in the future. So they cannot have an influence on the outcome B. But if the theory is Lorentz invariant, we can also look at the predictions of the theory in another Lorentz frame in which the measurement uh, event A happens before the measurement event B. Okay, in this frame, the theory should predict the outcome A independent of the outcome and parameter choice B because in this frame they haven't hap they didn't happen yet. They lie in the future. But if you had both at the same time, right, then the theory would predict, so not at the same time meaning not, not in the sense of this diagram, in the sense that you can look at the predictions of the theory in different frames, and the theory would predict the outcome A independent of the outcome and parameter choice B, and it would predict the outcome B independent on the outcome of parameter choice A, and this would exactly be a Bell local model, which is exactly ruled out by experiment confirming the violation of the CHSH. Yes.
Well, the problem is that the problem is that this would be a local explanation. This local explanation cannot exist. Together, they would amount to a local model. This theory together. So, the argument is that the Lorentz covariant explanation of the correlations would be a Bell local explanation of the correlations. And this is ruled out by the violation of the CHSH inequality. So, there's no logical contradiction here. You're right, there's no logical contradiction here. But in this frame, the, if you do the look at the theory in this frame, predicts the outcome B independent of this data here. If you look at the theory in this frame, it predicts the outcome here independent of the data there, right? But together, this would mean that you have a Bell local model. If all the relevant lambdas, right, you can, chose, you can choose a relevant lambda that predicts both, uh, that gives you the statistic for both uh, outcomes independent of Right, the outcome A, the statistics for A, independent of the outcome and parameter choice B. And the statistics for B, independent of the outcome and parameter choice A. But this cannot be true because it would lead to a CHSH inequality which is violated in this paradigm. No, I did assume, so this is indeed an assumption that, in a, in a, this is indeed an assumption that one can uh, deny one of the possible. So one of the uh, one of the possible solutions is that to assume that it is possible that in some frames the future influences the past, which would be what it looks like in this example. This is a this is a possibility. I should also say, but this is not this argument. There's a different argument also by Gisa, which says that if you assume a maximal velocity v which is greater than C, this leads in a different setup to signaling. So basically this is ruled out as well if you, um, if you assume non-signaling. So indeed quantum locality seems to mean indeed a form of instantaneous influence, not even a form of, so to speak, tachyonic influence. But this is just a, a side remark. There's a different, there's a different uh, argument there. But indeed, it would seem that here the possible solutions are maybe not all frames or Lorentz frames are equal. Maybe there is, in fact, a preferred foliation of space-time. Okay, this would mean to give up the perfect Lorentz symmetry and to assume basically that either the formulation of in this frame or the formulation in this frame, let's say, is fundamental, is correct. So you would have, want then to keep phenomenologically Lorentz invariance so that you cannot detect the preferred foliation of space-time, but there might still be fundamentally in the laws of nature a preferred foliation of space-time. The second possibility would be some sort of retrocausality, which is actually something that I'm somewhat sympathetic to. Recall that I made the argument that in one frame of reference, the measurement B happens after the measurement A, so what happens at B cannot have any influence at A, right? Here I assumed in some sense a causal error of time, so I assumed that in 
any frame, the future cannot influence the past. And this assumption might well be wrong. There might actually be some sort of backwards in time influence. This is more natural. I'm sympathetic to this as well, but many people consider that as quite radical. So I'm open to this as well. That would be a worry, yes. But, and that you will have somehow to, to rule out. But you see that in, with this example, instantaneous influences do not necessarily allow you to do faster than light signaling. So you would, your hope is that to show that if you have a well-defined theory with retrocausal influences, then you can somehow show that you cannot use this for faster than light signaling or for, for, for other sort of causal paradoxes. But this would have to come out of an analysis of the theory. Maybe there are some thermodynamic, thermodynamic arguments. That's a valid point, yeah. Maybe retrocausality is not a good, I should say maybe advanced action or backwards influence. Or, yeah, maybe retrocausality is, is too strong, too strong a word. Um, the third possibility, which is actually, I, I, I would say, the best worked out so far is to use stochastic collapse models. And the stochastic collapse models, indeed, they are deterministic, they are stochastic, random in a way that uh, does not allow you to say which event influences what other event, but you can still set up the collapse law such that it is relativistically invariant and gives you consistent statistics for these correlated measurement events without allowing you to give a cause, any sort of causal explanation which event influences what other event. And the first consistent model in this sense was formulated by Roderich Tumolka, oh, it's already 10 years ago, uh, which is a relativistic GRW theory with the flash ontology. However, this theory is non-interacting. It's a free theory, but still it's very interesting that you can have a consistent non-local theory that gives you these non-local correlations in a consistent Lorentz invariant way. Yes. It's difficult to, difficult to say in, in general. So you see, for instance, that you, you have now two competing. So if you have Bohmian mechanics and GRW, for instance, one is a deterministic theory, the other one is a stochastic theory, and they are still both compatible with the experimental data. So in, at some point, they may no longer be, but not because of not because of, uh, of stochasticity. Retrocausality, you mean? Yeah, that, that, de that, depends on, that depends on the theory that you can only discuss when you have a, that you can only discuss when you have a formulated theory. Right? The theory will have to tell you what predictions it makes that could reveal the retrocausality. But the thing is, we do not observe retrocausality on macroscopic scales. So within such a theory, if the theory is sound, there must be some reason why, why typically you do not see retrocausal influences. Right, there must be some argument for that. Sorry? We don't, no, we don't. So uh, one, one proof that we don't know that we do not have retrocausality 
is that there is an alternative formulation of classical electrodynamics, the wheel alignment theory. I don't know if you've heard of that, which is in fact time symmetric. So it assumes that particles interact by advanced fields and retarded fields along past light cone and future light cone. And Miller and Feynman actually give an argument, some sort of statistical argument, um, why you would not really see any advanced radiation, so to speak, but why you would effectively see only uh, retarded radiation, some sort of thermodynamic argument. So to the degree that this argument is convincing, and in the regime that classical electrodynamics is right, it could actually be a theory that has advanced interaction and it's still compatible with an experiment. So yeah, this is right. It may be the case that the true theory of nature is time symmetric in the sense that you have advanced and retarded interaction. Yes, yes. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. I think Andre commented a bit on this on the last talk. So if non-locality could be a motivation for quantum gravity, I, I guess this is an interesting interesting project. Yeah, yes. right. <laughs> so you, you had it on the blackboard at least. So I'm a friend of doing one step at a time. So my feeling is that somehow reconciling quantum non-locality and just special relativity would be like the next step. And quantum gravity is still very far away. This is my feeling. But it could be that, it could be that really the solution to this tension will come only once we understand quantum gravity. That's, that's of course a possibility. Um, so let me, yeah, fortunately I have just one minute, let me, let me make another comment. Yeah, this is quite interesting also, but I have to skip this, unfortunately. I also have to skip this. So I wanted to say that because the question is, can Fermian mechanics be made relativistic? So this is not so easy um, because in Fermian mechanics, you have this non-local law of motion, which is such that which is such that uh, the velocity of a particle at one time depends on the position of, in principle, all the other particles at the same time. And if you want to do this in relativistic space-time, it uh, seems that you would need still some sort of synchronization of the, uh, some sort of synchronization of the particles. And it would seem that you have to, uh, you need a preferred foliation of space-time to formulate a relativistic generalization of the Bohmian law. But there is an idea, which is, I think, quite intriguing, that this preferred foliation of space-time could, in fact, come out of the universal wave function by a Lorentz invariance law, Lorentz invariant law. So there are some proposals for that that one would have to discuss and study but in principle, one idea is that the preferred foliation of space-time uh, comes out by a Lorentz invariant law from the universal wave function. And that you use this to generalize the Bohmian law of motion to, uh, uh, general, 
to a special relativistic spacetime at least. So the question to the, uh, so the answer to the question, can Bohmian mechanics be made relativistic? The best answer that we can give right now is what exactly do you mean by relativistic? So such a model would be Lorentz invariant, completely Lorentz invariant. It would satisfy, it would not allow for faster in light signaling. It would satisfy local commutativity. It would make sure that there's no preferred Lorentz frame empirically detectable. So uh, in principle, at least for doing the statistics, all Lorentz frames are, uh, are equal. Um, so in all of these senses, such a model would be relativistic, but it would be not relativistic in the very strong sense that you are in some sense messing with special relativistic space-time structure. So at least in this model, on a fundamental level, you are adding something to your special relativistic space-time structure, a preferred foliation of space-time, even though this preferred foliation of space-time is not like introduced by hand or ad hoc, but the idea is would come out from the wave function itself. So in this way, the wave function would somehow synchronize the motion of uh, uh, the particles. So there are also other attempts in other directions, but um, so the state of the art is that in principle, yes, you can make Bohmian mechanics compatible with special relativity, but at some, at some cost. If you're adding, although in a weak sense, some sort of extra structure to special relativistic space-time to generalize the Bohmian law of motion to a special relativistic space-time. But in any case, there's, a, there's this interesting challenge how to reconcile uh, quantum non-locality with, a, with relativity, and something has to go. There will be a price to pay to make a consistent, uh, to make a consistent uh, non-local special relativistic uh, theory. This price may come in form of backwards in time influences, or it may come in form of a very strong stochasticity, as in the relativistic collapse models, or it may come in form of a preferred foliation, but some compromise will have to be made to get a really consistent relativistic quantum theory. And well, let me leave you with this thought. If, if we come to the conclusion that we have to give up either relativity or non, or non locality, so if either non locality or relativity has to go, then you would have to let go relativity because despite all the successful predictions that we have from the assumption of Lorentz invariance and from the assumption of Minkowski space-time, at least in some regime, um, those are all phenomenological things that you could, in principle, reproduce with other models, whereas Bell's theorem rules out in a very strong sense all local models that want to reproduce the correlations observed in the experiment. So in some sense, we have a stronger confirmation for non-locality as a fact of nature than we have for relativity in the sense of fundamental Lorentz invariance. So I hope and I believe that relativity and non-locality can be reconciled. And I think there are, there are very good progresses along these lines. But if either one has to go, we have to keep non-locality and uh, and give up uh, relativity. And here's just schematically the idea how you would use backwards causation, basically to establish a correlation between A and B. So instead of going basically directly from B to A, you would use some, uh, zigzag causality, is something called, go for instance along the backward light cone. And those are ideas that this retrocausation that many people have envisioned and not all of them are crazy people. Um, and let me end with an important quotation from John Bell again, which I've quoted very often. So let me leave you as I'm finishing my last talk with this quote. So he says, the usual quantum paradoxes 
are simply disposed of by the 1952 theory of foam. We could also add collapse models and possibly many worlds to that. But the usual quantum theory, uh, the usual quantum paradoxes are simply disposed of by the 1952 theory of foam, leaving as the question, as, as the question, the question of Lorentz invariance. So one of my missions in life is to get people to see that if they want to talk about the problems of quantum mechanics, the real problems of quantum mechanics, they must be talking about Lorentz invariance. So I think this fits very well the topic of this meeting. So I think it's a very good uh, message to, to come to an end and close this lecture. Thank you.